adventure, sports, outdoors. With host, Harry Canterbury. There I was, back in the wild again And I fell right at home, where I belong I had that feeling, coming over me again Just like it happened so many times before yeah. Hi, Harry Canterbury with another edition of Adventure Sports Outdoors. I'm holding in my hand here an 1873 Winchester. This is not a replica, this is the real McCoy. Also, I have in my uh, holster here, uh, this is a Doc Holliday holster. This is a Peacemaker, a 3840. This is a replica, but everything else on the table here is not. Uh, I'm at a friend's house who has quite a collection of guns that uh, date back, uh, some of them, over 125 years ago. So stay tuned today for an interesting show on collecting guns. Adventure Sports Outdoors, brought to you in part by Corsaw Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products and buyers of standing timber in Smithfield. Rawlings Trailer Sales, supplying sportsmen with all their trailer needs just south of Hopedale. Remax, specializing in commercial and recreational property in Peoria. Michael O'Brien, President. Kaler's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Furious Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. Alwyn and Sons Meat Company, since 1957, located in Peoria Heights, Illinois. Our thanks to these sponsors. And now I'd like to uh, introduce Jim Smalley, the uh, collector of this uh, fine collection. Now, Jim, you've got another one in your hand there, buddy. What's that? This is a Schofield break open. Uh, this is a, uh, a 45 long Colt, but a uh, type of gun that Billy the Kid used to uh, use when he was uh, running his terror around the southwest. Now the only difference between the gun that he had and the, and the one that we're looking at here is uh, there was no trigger guard, right? He had his trigger guard seared off so he could reach for the trigger quickly. The guy was a madman. He was, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I want to get started talking about all these guns. I mean, you, this is just a fraction of the guns that you have in uh, your possession. You've got all sorts of stuff in the basement. And you collect a specific caliber, the 3840. How did you get interested in that caliber? And you pretty much stuck to it. You could go to 45s and, and many other calibers. Why do you do the 3840? Well, uh, when I got into uh, shooting cowboy action about uh, 10, 15 years ago, I started looking into the history of cowboy action, cowboy movies, and the history of the Southwest. And along the way, I, I learned that John Wayne did all his... Our hero. Yes, our <laughs> hero, Mr. Wayne, uh, did all his movies carrying a 3840 caliber uh, weapons. Our earliest introduction to the heroes and villains of the Old West came to us in the form of dime novels that began around 1850 and proceeded into the 20th century. These hastily written novels, often called Beatles dime novels, were the first to romanticize the gunfighters of the Wild West. And later, in the early 1900s, writers such as Zane Gray and Louis L'Amour carried the tradition to even greater heights. The real cowboys and characters of this period were much less exciting than their modern day portrayals, but they were interesting in their own way. And in all of these stories, one thing remained constant, the idea that everyone was carrying a pistol or a rifle. To, ex to that extent, that was true. The reality was that the West was in fact the Wild West, and justice was often decided by the use of a weapon. But just how often these weapons were fired in self-defense was completely a different story. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of famous and not so famous characters that made up the frontiersmen of the Old West. People like Jesse James, Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, 
Bat Masterson. William Bonney, otherwise known as Billy the Kid. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And the Dalton Gang. But there were other lesser known outlaws and lawmen, such as Clay Allison. John Wesley Harden. Tom Horn. Buckskin Frank Leslie. Killing Jim Miller. And Frank Reno. Cowboy heroes of the Old West have been portrayed in very romantic, exaggerated terms and usually inaccurate ways as the following examples indicate. The emphasis was on entertainment and not fact. And we've all seen movies and western shows like these. horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. So I, I went out and I investigated the 3840, which is a bottleneck cartridge, and I found that, and I, and I actually purchased a, uh, a pistol in 3840 and started shooting it. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the caliber. I really enjoyed reloading it. It was an easy uh, caliber to reload for not only modern powders, but also for black powders. And so I just continued looking and, see, and searching for that caliber of of uh, rifle or pistol uh, to add into my collection. So that particular caliber was, uh, you know, used quite frequently by cattlemen and farmers and ranchers and and outlaws and everybody else. It was quite popular. It was uh, most uh, in re in reality, most of the bottleneck cartridges, the 3840, the 4440, were the most popular of uh, the calibers. It's always been said that people believe that the 45 caliber was the, uh, was the caliber of choice in the Southwest during that period. In, in reality, it was really the 4440 and the 3840. Just was that the 45 Long Colt had a better press agent. Uh, being a bottleneck, which uh, to explain to the audience, a bottleneck is very much like uh, what you see in a long neck bottle of beer. There is a short, stubby top that widens out to the base. That prevents black backflow of, of smoke and propellant into the action of the weapon. That means you can shoot the weapon longer and faster and not be worried that your, your action is going to jam up. The straight cases, like the 45 Long Colt, not just allowed soot and smoke and everything, especially in the black powder era, to come back into the action. And that could gum up the works. So. That's why the 3840 was and so popular. The 4440 was more popular. They just didn't have the press agents of the 45. It was a mechanical advancement, really, basically. Really. really. Uh, the other thing that uh, people would like to know is, and uh, we may dispel some of the <laughs> what they believe, and that the shoot ups, you know, uh, like uh, out in Tucson, Arizona, and Tombstone, which I think was probably the, one of the few real gun uh, you know, shootouts, which really did happen and, and in Tombstone, uh, Arizona. But uh, for the movies, when we were young watching Gunsmoke and Bonanza and, and uh, my goodness, The Rifleman, and the, they, all go, they go on and on and on, shows that we all grew up with, that was romanticized. Uh, that was, uh, 
They were, they were made up so they could sell dime uh, store novels, right? Tremendously so. Uh, really, uh, most of the shoot-ups of the day happened on the wrong side of town, never happened on Main Street. Uh, these were like barroom brawls that spilled out into the street. Uh, we still have those today. Uh, and again, you're so correct in saying that a lot of the outlaws of the Southwest were romanticized to, to sell these dime store novels and, or, and send them back to Chicago and New York and Baltimore, where people of the day could fantasize about the Southwest. This was the new frontier. This was like reading the Star Trek of today. Well, there was no radio, no TV. No, and that was their entertainment of, of the time. Yeah. And, and uh, the journalists of the time, to sell what they could sell, would maybe put a little bit more fiction than fact in there. I think the term factition comes to mind, but uh, like the journalist of today, never let the truth interfere with a good story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so true. You know, and that's what they were. And, 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 and there were heroes made out of, of villains and criminals and bank robbers. And, uh, and they had the popularity to the point that when many of them either died during, like the Dalton brothers, when they died during their last bank robber, attempt, they were put on display and people were charged a dime to go buy. That was uh, in Coffee, Kansas or something somewhere like, like that? That, yeah. that people were charged a dime to go by and look at them. I mean, these were popular people of the day. One of the few shootouts that did occur was the gunfight at the Old K Corral. It wasn't fought on the main street, but out on the outskirts of town near a cattle corral. Of course, Hollywood once again has jazzed it up a bit to make it more entertaining. Watch your guns. One of the biggest exaggerations about the Old West were the weapons used by the gunslingers. Many of the famous gunfighters of the Old West carried revolvers, and they also carried shotguns, known for their deadly effect at close range. Jim has spent time over the past attending and taking part in cowboy action shooting events, of which he is a true active member. At times, action shooters gather from all over the country to take part in these events. You are required not only to compete, but to be in full period dress. And these events not only attract male members, but also females and young kids. Well, when I, when I started going into uh, cowboy action shooting, I went out and I observed a, a shoot, and I was just fascinated by it. And I started then collecting some of the equipment you need for cowboy action shooting. And the first uh, piece of equipment, of course, that I, I acquired was my holster. Uh, this is a uh, special holster for cowboy action. It's what's called a cross-draw holster. It has loops for my cartridges, but also loops for my shotgun shells. Cowboy action is a three-gun series. You have to have two pistols, a rifle, and a shotgun. And it's all done for time and accuracy. Now, you've got a 97 here. Would this be a, a used for that uh, yes. stuff? Yes, this is a, a legitimate uh, a shotgun for it. You could have a side-by-side, -side, double barrel, uh -huh. double trigger, coach gun. It's perfectly legal. Down to 20 gauge. Now, there are so many different classes in cowboy action shooting that everybody can get involved. Most of the fun in cowboy action shooting is not just the shooting. 
It's getting dressed in period uh, correct uh, outfits, grabbing a handle that, uh, that defines you, and just going out and having a good afternoon of fun with some other people who enjoy the sport as much as you do. Okay, and uh, this here is the uh, U.S. Army Ruger, and this is a black powder gun. Right. This is what's called the Ruger Army. It is a black powder uh, 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 cap and ball. It is uh, basically used when you're shooting in, uh, in cavalry action if you want to shoot in black powder or fourth tier class. Uh, again, uh, this is not a cartridge weapon. This is a, a cap, uh, cap and ball over black powder. You have to load this beforehand. And it's a, a, a still a modern gun. Has absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's Ruger's design, but it's, uh, it's still um, legal in, ca uh, in cavalry action. This is a Ruger, finally, this is a Ruger Bisley, again in 38, uh, uh, in 38 uh, uh, caliber. Uh, this has a Bisley grip with a different type of hammer. If you notice, this is a very flattened hammer. Uh, again, uh, the Bisleys, original Bisleys were Colts. And uh, there are, you can go out and try, find the original Bisleys and uh, Colt manufacturers. They're very expensive because they're very rare. Uh, get, to get an original working Colt Bisley is, is a, really a challenge. Uh, Ruger came along with their model. They modernized it again for competition in the cowboy action field. Uh, this one has not been tuned as of yet because I've just actually acquired this from our good friends down at uh, Peak and Gun. But it is just, uh, again, it's a different feel of, of weapon. As you see, it has a longer barrel. Uh, I have yet to use this in competition. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to do that in the, in the summer, and we'll see how this one, uh, this one works. Finally, this is the Schofield. And we talked a little bit about the Schofield earlier uh, because Billy the Kid had one without, without the, uh, uh, the guard on it. Sco I, I actually carry this to all competitions with me. Every so often you will go into cowboy action and they will have a stage where you have to reload. Well, if you, got, if you have to reload, what you have to do is then empty your uh, single action weapon out and, and then chamber another weapon, roll the barrel around to the right position, and then cock it to bring it to position and then shoot. With a brake top, all I do, if I have to have a stage to reload to save time, it's emptied, I put it in, it's loaded, it's ready to fire. Yeah, it's quick. It's quicker. Yeah. So I always bring one of these to, uh, to competitions in case there's a stage where you have to reload under the clock. Jim, um, you know the sad thing about owning these guns, uh, knowing that there was uh, some guy who's been deceased maybe a hundred years or so, uh, the history of these guns, who bought them originally, uh, where were they used? What were they used for? Did they uh, were they used in wars and battles? Did they uh, kill anybody? Um, you know, were they passed down in the family? But have you did you ever have a gun that that you could trace the history? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, this is a Civil War uh, uh, rifle. This is a Remington, 50-70 caliber, black powder, of course. This was is issued by the New York National Guard. It had, its rack number here was 83, and it was issued somewhere along the line. This gun was owned by a man by the name of Denton, D-E-N-T-O-N. And uh, he's kind of got that marked into the stock here. And guns like this exist. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who uh, was shooting cowboy action with me, and he went off and he also bought an old Civil War uh, trapdoor rifle. And he was cleaning it one day, and he took off the butt plate. And in the, in the stock behind the butt plate was a map. Now starts his quest. He has spent the last few years traveling around the south and southern Illinois trying to find what this map is to. For all we know, it could be the map to the, from his tent to the latrine. But it's a map, and, it, and he and his wife have started a quest which has been a lot of fun. They've been through a lot of small towns. They've looked into the history. They've tried to track the serial number. He's, ha he's ha actually having a lot of fun doing it. But he has an original weapon with someone's hand-drawn map in it, which it makes it special to him. And it would make it special to any uh, uh, gun owner. I uh, this particular gun, the uh, trapdoor, was a rarity. There wasn't very many issued uh, in a lot of times, the regiments bought their own guns, or the people that were going into the 
a civil war, if they had money, would buy their own gun. And later in the war, the, uh, uh, the trap door was available, uh, the repeater was available, but very few people were ever issued repeaters or uh, a cartridge type. They were still using the this was, 61, 63 Springfield, 58 This was challenge. very late, uh, late, and I can never even say whether, the, uh, this is a Remington, and this type of action, single action, rolling block action, ended up being used in many, many different countries. Remington uh, actually made their fortune selling this type of action and this weapon to Argentina, Spain, Mexico, United States. Uh, it was used all over the world because it was such a reliable rolling block mechanism. Uh, here in this country, this was kind of introduced late, uh, uh, towards the end of the, of the era. Uh, Spanish-American War, possibly, things of that nature. But still, uh, this is in a 50-70 black powder caliber. Uh, I can, this is, this uh, weapon is actually still accurate out to about 200 yards. So you shot this? Oh, of course. I, I, every one of my, uh, every one of my uh, rifles and pistols I shoot on a routine basis, which makes cleaning on a routine basis interesting. But uh, I've shot them all, and I reload them all. And, that, and that's one of the reasons I like it. I, again, um, uh, I got it, uh, how I got interested in this is, again, through Cowboy, Cowboy action actually matured up and then stated, okay, we can shoot our, our light caliber rifles and our light caliber pistols, but we also had buffalo hunters. Let's try to do some buffalo silhouette shooting. That would be long distance shooting with rifles like, like this. So that's how I got into it. You the one killed our friend? That's right. I shot the boy too and I enjoyed it. Hi, I'm Dave Barth with your shooting tip of the week. Today we're going to talk about concealed carry. Illinois is the closest it's ever been to having a concealed carry. 48 states have concealed carry, Illinois and Wisconsin being the last holdouts. Every state that has passed concealed carry, violent crime has gone down. Florida, for example, has gone down 20%. Here today we have some examples of some handguns that would make excellent concealed carry handguns. This is a Taurus 380. For the lady in your life, it has a pink frame. We jump down to the Charter Arms Pink Lady and a Lavender Lady. For the guys or gals, we have some Smith & Wesson and Taurus revolvers. They're lightweights, 38 and 357. In semi-automatics, there's many choices. Here's two examples. Here's a Car Arms 9mm and a Smith & Wesson Bodyguard 380 with a laser. I'm Dave Barth with your shooting tip of the week. We have a short highlight section of the guns of the Old West and the people who made up this large cast of colorful characters.
Adventure Sports Outdoors, brought to you in part by Corsaw Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products and buyers of standing timber in Smithfield. Rawlings Trailer Sales, supplying sportsmen with all their trailer needs just south of Hopedale. Remax, specializing in commercial and recreational property in Peoria. Michael O'Brien, President. Kaler's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. Alwyn and Sons Meat Company, since 1957, located in Peoria Heights, Illinois. Our thanks to these sponsors. 